All right, we're 7 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I don't know about you guys, but I felt like it was so dark, it felt like 8 o'clock out there on the way in. It's funny how that one-hour difference makes a difference when you're driving and it's dark. You're just so used to being a certain lightness or darkness, and it makes it harder on the drive. So we're going to be wrapping up Lesson 2. We were in the application portion, so we're going to review just a little bit what we covered, just briefly to kind of get the story back in our head. We'll finish up the application section, then we'll get into chapter two, which is lesson three. And if you didn't happen to look at your syllabus, um, chapter two we're gonna cover in three lessons. So what we'll cover tonight is really just the details of the story. And then Sunday we'll come back and talk about the actual interpretation of the dream. So we're not gonna really get into the interpretation tonight. We're gonna talk about the interpretation on Sunday and the history that, that ties into that, what it was prophesying and what actually came true. And then the third lesson, we'll actually talk about applications. There's a lot of applications for us, and so we're going to spend that whole lesson just talking about applications. So we'll kind of briefly cover some of the things that we can apply, but we'll just wait and make those applications in the last lesson. That's kind of how I plan to break it down, so hopefully it'll go close to that. We'll see. Um, we may not quite get through the, this stuff in lesson three today. I think we probably will, but if not, there's, we'll, we'll kind of pull back onto so we're on our syllabus on Sunday. So let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump in, jump into everything. Yahweh, our God and Father, we are so thankful for the lives that you've given us, for the salvation that you've given us, for the relationship with you that we have, that you tell us about you and who you are and who you want us to be. And we ask as, you, as we study Daniel that you would help us to understand, help us to understand the prophecies, help us to understand the power that you have through what we see, and help us to make applications that you would have us to, that we can be more faithful servants of yours. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. All right. So chapter 1, what happened at the beginning of that? Yeah, he attacked Judah and he took a bunch of people captive, right? So it was the first of the three invasions and Daniel went back in that first one, 605 B.C. And so he took them back and then what did he decide he wanted to do? He took the best ones the young, of the young men and wanted to train them for three years, right? So that they could serve, be in his service and they were going to learn the literature and language of the Chaldeans. They were going to be trained. Um, one of the things that he wanted that he kind of offered, but it was expected of all the men, was what? As far as what they ate. The king's delicacies, right? So he was going to prepare them, but part of that was to have the best food and the food that he would offer. Daniel didn't want to partake of that because it would defile him for whatever reason, because of his, his um, being a Jew. And so he requested that he and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with their Babylonian given names, um, that they could abstain from that. And so they... They were told no initially, but Daniel said, give us a test, right? And then after the test, miraculously, they were actually healthier than everybody else. Um, and so what did we say was the outcome at the end of their training period? Because it kind of jumps from the beginning of the training period to the end of the training period in this chapter, right? So at the end of the 10 days in verse 15, they looked that they were healthier than everyone else. But then what happens after that, verses 17 through the end of the chapter? Yeah. Yeah. So they surpassed everyone else, the people in their training program, as well as the people who are already wise men, the older people of, of, of his country that had already been there. So they, and they said they were 10 times better than everybody else. So that's kind of the, the story. So let's... Um, Simon fixed us up with a new projector and a new cable, so I think we're okay now. I guess if you complain enough, then you get, you get some action out of it. <laughs> I think I'm just the recipient of lots of people having problems over several semesters, probably. All right, so let's, let's spend a little time talking about the applications. We were kind of thinking about question seven. And to me, one of the key points of this chapter is back in verse 8 where it says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself and I think that's kind of the focal point of, of what happened from here that Daniel purposed in his heart um, so these men became wise and they became close to God because they purposed to do so and that doesn't just happen by accident so we we're talking about how we can specifically apply this principle Right. Yeah. 
and certain things will happen by accident, but improvement doesn't happen by accident, right? It's, always, it's almost always the opposite. You may stay the same by accident, but we don't get better typically by accident, unless we purpose to do so. And so let's, let's kind of think about Daniel relative to that, one of the things about knowing the word. Again, we talked about how old these men, young men were. How old did we conclude they probably were? Teenagers, yeah, we don't know exactly, but because of what they were being trained for and how old we know, or we know Daniel was still around 65 late, years later and still in the service, they were probably in their mid-teenage years somewhere. But, but Daniel's, he's taken out of his country. What did he know about the word at this point? He knew what he could eat and not eat, right? He knew what he was taught about what that food would do to him, so he, he remembered that and brought it with him. Uh, we see later on that he was reading the scripture, so we don't know if he brought that with him or he was able to obtain copies of that later on, but the word was important to him and, and knowing what God's word taught. So that's something that we have to do as part of that too. So one of the things that we can purpose then is to know God's word, right? So if we purpose to know God's word, what's that, what's that gonna entail for us? What's gonna happen? Am I going to be comfortable just coming to worship and sitting in the auditorium and just coming to a class and sitting and listening to somebody else talk about it? If I purpose to know God's word? I don't believe so at all. I think that that, that means if I purpose to know his word, it's going to be important to me to be in it myself. Reading it myself, thinking about it, meditating on it, praying about it. So that's going to be very important to me if I purpose to know his word. So it's not just something that happens by accident and just by showing up. We have to dig in and be intentional about it. That's right. Yeah. And these guys started young, and we're going to see as we move along the massive impact that had in Daniel's life and on the whole world around him because he purposed when he was young. Remember, he was creator in the days of his youth. But what about us? I mean, Guthrie, are you youth? <laughs> Most most of, us, most of us in this room would not be considered youth at this point, right? A few of us might be, but it depends on your relative age, right? Jonah might be from my age point, but you know, from your vantage point, you're probably not because you've already been through several things in life. But is there an application we can take from that? Does that principle still apply? Remember your creator in the days of your youth, even though I'm not young anymore? Yeah, wherever I'm at at this point, I can start focusing on that now and grow from where I am, right? But it goes back to purposing to do that. So it's something that we have to be intentional about. Our holiness is not going to happen just as a result of showing up and going to church and making sure we follow some set of rules that we've been given. Patrick? There's a massive amount of peer pressure there for him, wasn't there? And there still is for us. I don't, I don't care how old we are. Whatever things we struggle with when we're young tend to be the same things we struggle with when we're old, and the peer pressure still exists. It may change in how it manifests itself, and the longer that we don't succumb to it, the more often we don't succumb to it, the stronger we get, and it seems to have less impact, but it's still there. Um, and I think the food probably was a big issue. I mean, they're in a different country. We talked about how they're getting the, you know, the royal treatment, the king's delicacies. We've probably all been someplace where there's just this unbelievable buffet that we don't ever get to partake of that kind of food. And it's all really intriguing to want to see what things taste like and what they're like, you know, the way the other side eats, right? So there, there would have been a lot of pressure from that standpoint for him. Um, so the, the point for us from that is to purpose the things we want to be. Man, we can purpose to be the kind of person, as far as our qualifications, the kind of personality that we are, that we would be qualified to be an elder if we're married and have kids. 
that could be something that we purpose at, a, at any point, but especially at a younger age, so that we're going to grow and develop to be that kind of a person. We can purpose that I'm going to be somebody who knows the word well enough that I could teach whether I'm in that position or not. Um, there's lots of things that we can purpose, but we need to set that in our mind. We can purpose that I'm going to make sure I talk to all my friends about what the Lord has done for me. There's a lot of things that we can purpose, but it starts by being intentional about it um, in our mind, that that's something I'm going to do. Let's look at question eight. Do you think Daniel's decision in one eight to purpose that he was not going to defile himself, do you think that might have impacted the other three men's decisions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because we're, we're, not, we're not told here that all four of them went before Arioch, right? It's that Daniel did. Do you think Daniel's decision might have been something that impacted those three guys? Yeah. I mean, it certainly would strengthen with all four of them working together, right? And we don't know if it's, yeah, Jordan? Oh, I thought, you know, it's like an auction, man, don't move. <laughs> Did I see another hand? Yeah, so we're, we're not told specifically that it was just Daniel's thought, but he's the one that's pointed out as that, and then it's, it's all four of them, right? Um, and so it would seem to me that he was, he was kind of the ringleader to do this, but, and it would strengthen their resolve because he stood up for it. And we don't know that for sure, but that seems to be the implication to me. But certainly, um, and, unless they all talked about it first and, and all four of them went before and it's just not recorded that way for us, Daniel's decision would have impacted them. Do we see later on, I know we're jumping ahead, but most of you studied Daniel before, do we see some strength in those three guys that shows up a little bit later? And how do you think it would have impacted them if Daniel hadn't stood up at this point in time? We don't know, but maybe they wouldn't have had the resolve when they were told to, to bow down and worship that they ended up having if, if Daniel hadn't stood up at this point in time. So there was, there was some strength in what he did. So how do we apply that concept in our lives? That's Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, but how do we apply that principle? Barbara? flip side is true also, right? Good company strengthens our morals. Yeah, so we can surround ourselves with people that will help. I think also, as Daniel did, if we want to be like Daniel, we can be the one that strengthens other people, right? So uh, Daniel's decision, his choice here was between something wrong and something right. Something easy and something that was difficult. But that's not always the decision that we have, is it? Sometimes isn't it something that's okay, but maybe not the best decision, but it's easier, and something that's more difficult and better? I think we're faced with that a lot of times. But if we choose the thing that may be more difficult but is the right thing or the better thing, is that going to impact other Christians in our church family or other, other people that we know or maybe people at work? Will that have an impact on them if we're making those tough decisions and standing up for the right things? It's going to impact other people, and you never know where that's going to lead. I mean, we're going to see in chapters um, 2 and 4 the impact it has on Nebuchadnezzar because Daniel's living this way. So it can impact people of the world. It can impact other Christians if we just stand up and do the, the difficult thing. They, they were alone. It was four of them. For, initially, it's Daniel, is, is what we're told here. But it was four of them versus everybody else that was in their training program, as well as all of the rest of the Babylonian culture that was around them. I mean, they're basically standing alone in a very difficult situation, and yet it has a huge impact on their nation and on the, on the world around them eventually. And so we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. If we just stand up in every situation, we never know how far God's going to take that and how he's going to use it. Do you think Daniel, when he made this decision, thought, hey, this is going to have a huge impact and I'm going to be one of the wisest people and I'm going to be in the king's royal court eventually? And Do you think he even thought about that at all? Guarantee you that wasn't on his mind. He was just probably thinking about, man, I, I got to do the right thing, but I'm probably going to die. That's what was on his mind at this point in time. And yet, we're reading the end of the story, and so we see it from a different perspective. But because he stood up and did the right thing, it had a massive impact. And I don't, I don't believe it's any different for us today. Somebody had a hand. Yes? Uh, but your example in the New Testament of that also. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, remember, the Apostle Paul had to stand up. He called out Peter. Yep. Remember? He, um, Peter was eating, they were eating with the, with the Gentiles, but when the Jews came along, 
consider he didn't throw one of away from him, right? Throw one of away and and uh, you know the but anyway, the point is Paul stood up for the truth. And he's point even even Peter is showing that. Yeah, there, there's lots of examples in the New Testament, too. But I think sometimes we think, okay, that's the Bible. You know, we, we're, we're tied up in our life. That actually kind of leads, leads me to the um, last thing I want to talk about here, taking us back to our theme that God is in control. Let's look at question nine. Who caused the Babylonian captivity? God. Who caused Daniel to be liked by the commander? God did. Who made these four men so much better than everybody else? God. Now, that's kind of a fourth and fifth grade level question. You're probably looking at it thinking, why did he bother asking that? It's almost rhetorical, right? Why do you think I ask it that way? Got an idea? He's still in control. Yeah, and the, the thing is, I think we don't, we, we know that intellectually, but I don't think we always function that way. Do you think, any of these guys, do you think that, so put yourself again in the time of Daniel. Jerusalem's been overtaken. The temple's been raided. A bunch of captives have been taken back, and eventually, in a few years, the temple's destroyed, the temple of God. Is anybody there thinking, God's in control of this, he's causing it to happen? I don't think that's what was in their head. They're probably thinking, how did this happen? Is God still, is, is God real? Is he powerful? They're going to be thinking the opposite of that, because the circumstances they're in don't just stand up and say God's in control. We know it, because we're looking at the end of the story, right? But they were in it, and so it, it didn't look that way to them. When somebody raises to favor, especially in a difficult situation like this, was Daniel's natural human thought going to be, well, I've been raised to power with Ariok, the, the, the commander. I'm, I've been raised to this position because God's put me there. Do you think that's going to be the natural human response to that? What would the natural human response be when you raise up in a position like that? I mean, what are we tempted whenever we do good in a job position or any, any kind of position? What, what's our natural thought? I, I'm better, yeah. Look at what I've done, man. I'm good at this. I'm so wise. I'm so smart. I'm so whatever. So we give ourselves credit for that, that elevation, right? Because we're in the middle of the situation, and that's what we see. We don't step back and look at the big picture and think God's causing this to happen. It's his hand in all this. And the same thing with the four men, right? That just making them so much better. So the reason I ask that question is I think even they, they would have been not naturally inclined to think that way. We're not naturally inclined to think that way. We get in the middle of situations, whether they're bad things that happen, good things that happen to us, and it's just the course of life in our mind and in our eyes. But the reality is, God's in control. Even when bad things happen, he's still in control. That doesn't mean he, it's, natu- it's necessarily what he wants. Did he want his people to be taken into captivity? Did he want his temple to be destroyed? It's not what he wanted. But he allowed that to happen, and he used that, and even caused it to happen because he needed to get his people to a certain place. He did. Right. Right. But it wasn't what he wanted from the get-go. He wanted he wanted his people to have a good relationship with him, and because they didn't, and they broke the covenant, that's why he caused it to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he, he expects us to behave a certain way and to act, act no question. Yeah, he wants us to behave a certain way, but it's his hand in it. That doesn't mean there's not time and chance it happens. Ecclesiastes tells us time and chance happens to all men too. But ultimately, God's still in control. So my, my point is, when we step back and look at bad things that happen in life, we kind of think, well, that's just, you know, things are terrible. We don't realize God's still in control. And there's, there's a course that he's allowing to take through the nations, and there's a course of, of things that he wants to happen. We don't ever know what's, from our perspective, we don't know what he's just letting things happen and where, where he's causing it to happen, but God is still in control and he was in control then. When good things happen in our lives, he may be the one that's raising us up intentionally to a certain position. We don't know that, but we need to recognize that he's the one that has placed us in those positions and then use that for his credit and his glory. And we'll see how Daniel did that as we move along through this book. Um, but the thing I want us to remember, because I think it's so easy today to kind of think, okay, that's the Bible story. God was very involved, and he's just kind of put things on autopilot, and life's running until Jesus comes back and the world ends. But I don't believe that's what we're told. We'll see some, th- some verses coming up in some future chapters that tell us the things that, that we see happening are principles, not just specifically with the Babylonian Empire. 
So the point is, God is in control. God is in control. All right, any other comments on that before we move into chapter 2? All right, yes? I hadn't noticed that either. That's an excellent point. Yeah. That is an excellent point, Matt. Thank you for pointing that out to us. All right, let's move to chapter 2 now. And again, we're going to just kind of cover the events of the story tonight. Um, And then we'll move into the interpretation of the dream itself on Sunday. And then we'll come back and make application the, the lesson after that. So kind of like we talked about with some of the timing issues before in our introduction, there are some people that look at verse 1 and and are critical of it, because what does chapter 2, verse 1 say about the timing of this? It's the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, right? But how long was their training program? Three years. So if you step back and think about it, well, if it's in the second year of his reign, and they started in the beginning of his reign, and it was a three-year training program, you know, how can this happen before they've even finished their training program is kind of the, the question. So that's a conflict. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to... There could be that they're just good students, yeah. So that there's a lot of, lot of possibilities um, of, of how that could be handled. And we've, we talked a little bit about one of those is the difference in how you account for time, right? That the Jewish method would start with... The beginning would be the first year, whereas the... the Aramaic method of what the Babylonians used would be the zero year and then the first year, so that's one of the possibilities. But I ask you in question one, because some people are critical of that and the, the timing versus what it says right here, and if you go, part of that is not just verse one, but if you go to the end of the chapter, verse 48 and 49, it says that Daniel was promoted. And so they look at that and say, well, he got promoted before the training program even ended, and then you go back to chapter one and said that they were tested at the end of that three-year period, so that's a conflict. It was obviously written by somebody a long time afterwards. That's the, the critical line of thinking. The, I pointed out to you in question one, there are several ways to explain how that all fits together. So I ask you if you could think of what some of those explanations were. Because it's one thing to say, hey, that looks like a conflict, but not everything that looks like a conflict is. And so if we're going to be honest with it, we have to look at what are the possibilities. So what things did you think of that could be an explanation for that. Yeah, so maybe they were actually promoted during the training time. Yep. Matt? Mm-hmm. Right. So, and again, because of the way they accounted, when it says in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, here, this was actually probably what we would consider during the third year of his reign, because it would have been the zero year, first year, second year. So as is pointed out at the top of your question sheet, this is probably somewhere near the end of that three-year training period anyway. So maybe it was near the end of it, maybe it was right after it, Lynn. Very true. That's very true. Other possible explanations for what appears to be a conflict here? Look like you want to say something, Ethan. Yeah.
Well, until, the, until King Cyrus is actually the end of the whole Babylonian era, so that's when the Medo-Persian Empire takes over. So that you've, you've hit on what I think is a key point too, though. We think of these as being chronological, chapter one, then chapter two, then chapter three, then chapter four, but that's not necessarily true. And it's definitely not completely that way because of what you just pointed out. Because we've got chapter one at the very beginning, right? That's the training program. And then the last verse, verse 21, he jumps all the way down to 536 BC. Because Cyrus is 536 BC. So he, it's already not chronological. And then he jumps back in chapter two in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And that shouldn't really surprise us. Do we tell stories kind of that way sometimes? We start in a story and then we think, oh, well, there's this other thing that I need to point out to you about something else that happened way back here. And then we go back to our story. So. It, it, each chapter is a story that ties together, but it doesn't mean each, the whole book flows through from the beginning to the end in the chronological order. It definitely doesn't. Um, so we see that. So with that in mind, you know, some of this in chapter two may be overlaid with the training program. And I, that's what I personally think is, is the case. Um, so here, I'll, I'll just tell you what I think. It doesn't really matter. But I think chapter one, verses one to 18 comes first, their training program. And they're either at the end of that three-year period, right before, close to before it ends, or maybe shortly after, but somewhere near the end of that three-year period is when chapter two occurs. Um, and then we go back to the end of chapter one, verses 18 to 20, that says they were tested. So maybe this was part of Daniel's test, that if you know, he saw this, he's already passed the test of being wise. But maybe they went back and had this formal testing of 18 to 20. And then you go back to the end of chapter two, verse 48 and 49, is when Daniel's promoted. So it's very possible that chapter one actually kind of fits at the beginning and near the end of chapter two. Does that make sense? It's kind of jumping back and forth in the, the time frame. But this chapter, most of it seems to come right at the end of their training program near that point in time because of the way the time accounting was done. Um, so let me ask you this also before we get into all the details. Look at chapter 2, verse 46. King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded they should present an offering and incense to him. So if, if Nebuchadnezzar recognized Daniel and recognized God right here, why would he still test Daniel in chapter 1? Or if this, had, if, if this was after chapter 1, all of this, Remember, at the end of chapter 1, it said that he found them 10 times better than all the rest of their wise men. Why would he have not called for Daniel at the beginning of this chapter? So that's something to think about with the timing, too. Why do you think that could be? While you're thinking about that, let me just point out to you, if you look at 2.25, this is why I think chapter 2 happens before their training program's over. Chapter 2.25, when Nebuchadnezzar says that we're going to kill all the wise men because they can't interpret my dream. And then Daniel prays to God and they find the interpretation from God. It says in verse 25, Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and thus said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. So that would seem to imply that they're still part of the captives of Judah in the training program. And so this is before that ends. It doesn't matter, but it's just kind of interesting as you're trying to piece the whole timeline together. But back to the question, why would Nebuchadnezzar react this way? Wouldn't he have already known who Daniel was if chapter 1 was over? Or why would he treat Daniel this way if Daniel's a captive of Judah and he's just interpreted a dream for him? Well, let me point out a couple things to you. This is a, this is a world power leader. Remember what, what we talked about that he did to the king of Israel who rejected his leadership? He killed his sons in front of him and put out his eyes. That's the kind of guy we're dealing with. He's, he's a military man. He's brutal. He's powerful. And so he's going to go from event to event. He's going to kind of forget about the things behind, right? And we've all seen that. Any, anybody been in a workplace where you do something really helpful to your, your company, and three months later, it's like it's totally forgotten? You've got no credit for it. Somebody else is getting credit for things that are minor. I mean, we've all seen stuff like that happen. So people in leadership positions don't necessarily recognize all the things that they should and remember all the things that they should. It would be easy for him um, to forget about that. And he's, he's running a big, a massive nation, a military machine. He's got conquests going on in other places. So one event is, that stands out to us because what we're reading is not necessarily something he's going to remember. So it would be easy for him to have tested Daniel before and then have forgotten about it. It would be easy for him to have had Daniel interpret this dream at this point in time and 
you know, respond in a certain way, but not really think Daniel and, God, and his God are the, the God because of all the gods that they had. So that shouldn't really throw us in the timeline of everything because, just because he reacts that way. Does that all make sense? Just we've got to remember who we're dealing with, and we're seeing little snippets in time as we go through this, this story. It's not a time flow from beginning to end, and we're seeing all of the interactions between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so let's, um, and I forgot to pull up my slides for the next... go back here okay and I love finding old finding art and the way artists interpret things from the Bible even though a lot of times it's not accurate you probably can't read this because of the uh, resolution but this is called Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar by William Brassy Hole um, and then this is actually from a monastery in Kosovo I think it's from one, like a ceiling painting or a mosaic it's either on the ceiling or a wall. It's called Nebuchadnezzar's Dream. It's a fresco. So I just think those things are very interesting to look at the way people have interpreted it in art over the, over the years. So let's talk about the events here um, in chapter 2. So again, does anybody remember what the word Chaldean means? Because it says the king gave the command that after this dream, he has a dream that he can't remember. He's troubled. His sleep has left him. He gives an, or, an order to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. And depending on the translation you have, it may word that a little bit differently. It uses some different words. Um, the NIV actually translates that very differently, and I think it's by most felt not to be the best wording. But he, he uses the word Chaldean. Again, what does that mean, Matt? Right. And so when we see it here in a, in a grouping with all the other wise people, it means the wise men, right? Whereas if you see it just you know, from Chaldea type of meaning, then it, it means it's a regional or an ethnic term. So he's calling, he's calling for all of the wise men to interpret it. So um, what's, his, what's his demand of all, of all of the wise men? Tell me what the dream is and what it means, right? Okay, tell me what the dream is and what it means. Um, so question two asks you, um, to consider his interaction with these advisors. And I ask you in question A, how is he showing wisdom by this demand? So he can believe their interpretation, right? So, but what if he had just told them what the dream was? Yeah, they could have made anything up, right? Now, it's possible he couldn't remember the dream and he was wanting them to jog his memory, but some of the wording as we move through here seems to imply the opposite, that he knows what it is and he wants somebody to tell him what the dream is so he knows they're interpreting it properly. And I think we'll see as we move along, it's because he's very bothered by this dream. He wants to really know what it means, and so he doesn't want just some, well, I think it means this. He wants to know what this is about. That tells us there's something different about this dream from other dreams he's had, right? Why do you think there was something different about this dream from other dreams he's had? Because we all have dreams, right? Everybody dreams at some point. We don't, often don't remember them. Why did this one bother him? Why was it so different? Where did it come from? It came from God. This, so he didn't know that, but this was different than the other dreams he's had. He knew there was something different about it, and he knew there was something impactful about it. Um, so... Yeah, exactly. God does. And so, he, but he, he realizes there's something very, very different about this. Um, so let's look at question, the second part of that question. Why was his demand unreasonable from a human standpoint? We already kind of answered that. No man's going to know that, right? There's no way to know what somebody else has dreamed. We can maybe, you know, like it happens all the time. You're, you know, somebody you know, like my, Jenny will tell me about a dream she's had, and I'll say, well, maybe that's because you were thinking about this, and this happened last week, and you're worried about this happening, you know, down the road. So we kind of try to piece things together that would make sense. But, it, but she's told me what the dream was, right? It's unreasonable for somebody to say, tell me what I, what I, was, what was, what I dreamed as well as what it means. So from a human standpoint, totally unreasonable. Um, and then what was the sentence? What's the end of this interaction? If, he, if they can't interpret his dream, what's he say is going to happen? Who's going to be put to death? All of them. All of them. 
So he's just going to wipe out all of his wise men. So that tells you how troubled he is by this, right? How much it bothers him. Because he, that's his whole advisory council he's going to get rid of. That's a pretty, pretty big move. And we know he's... he's exactly, yeah. So they're, even though they're still in the training program right at the end of it, time frame, it's everybody. They're all going to go down. Um, so that's, that's the sentence that he passes on them. So when Daniel learns of this decree, question three for all the advisors, what does he commit to doing? Matt? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's because they wouldn't tell him right up front, or or because he's already had some things happen where he's suspicious, he he knows that they're not they're not going to be honest at this point. Yeah, so he's he's very suspicious of them. Good point. All right. So um, what does Daniel commit to doing when he learns of this decree? I'm sorry. Give him a. But he get he actually makes a commitment. He doesn't just say give me some time. What's his commitment? I'll tell you the dream. I'll tell you the dream and interpretation. Yeah. So he actually commits, and he knows where that's going to have to come from, right? He knows that's going to come from God, but he commits to it at that point in time. Um, you know, you could argue Daniel's just playing it wisely, because if, if he doesn't come up with interpretation, he's going to die anyway, right? So you could, interpret, you could argue, well, he's just trying to give himself some more time, and hopefully something will happen. But the fact that he commits to it and what we know about Daniel, I think he truly believes God's going to answer this for me. Because we're told back in chapter 1 that he was given the ability by God to interpret dreams. And so he probably knows that at this point in time, unless this is the first time it's happened. But he commits to it up front. And so that's something, think about that when we come back in the, a couple lessons from now and talk about applications. Think about that. The fact that he commits to God doing something when it's not really the easy answer or the, the obvious thing that's going to happen. Um, I think he has great faith here. Let's look at question 4. What occurs in order for this secret to be revealed to Daniel? I'm going to ask you to look at 17 through 19 for that. What has to happen, or what, ha what does happen? Jenny? Yeah, so he goes to his friends, the other faithful people, and he asks them to pray together, right? So that's the first thing that he does, is they pray about it. Um, and he, he kind of separates himself from everybody else, too, right? He kind of put off... And that would be easy to do, I think, in this kind of a setting. A lot of times we've got other things going on. It's not a big deal. This is a really big deal. Their lives are on the line at this point in time. So it would be easy to separate from everything else in this setting, I think. But that's a learning lesson for us, too, that he separates from everything else and they focus on praying to God and getting the answer uh, from God to solve the situation. But he goes to his companions who are faithful. And it says that they might seek the mercies of God, of heaven, concerning this secret. And then the secret was revealed to Daniel. How was it revealed to him? And then, yeah, and it says a night vision, right? And a night vision. So that's apparently different than a dream. I don't know if that's the same thing as a dream or not, the wording, but because, you know, dreams are dreams, and this says a night vision, so it seems to be a little bit different wording. Clearly, to Daniel, it's just it's something different than a dream, right, that he's given an answer. So he knows it's something specific. So that's the first thing that he does, and we're going to come back and talk about that when we talk about applications too, is he goes to his spiritual friends, and they pray about it. So after the dream and interpretation is revealed to Daniel, so we're told in verse 19 that it's revealed to Daniel in this night vision, what's the first thing Daniel does? Their life's on the line. They're about to be killed because of this. What's the first thing Daniel does when he's given the answer? He goes back to God and talks about it, right? So again, that's another application we'll come back and talk about, the fact that he doesn't take care of himself first. He turns around and prays to God and, and talks to God about it. Um, so we're going to talk about that some more as we move along, too. So let's look at question five. Daniel's prayer to God in verses 20 to 23 gives us some insight into the meaning of the dream, which, again, we'll talk about on Sunday. But how does, how does his prayer relate to the theme of the book that we're, we're, we're pointing out as the theme that God is in control? What's he really praying about here? Yeah, he does. And it's, if, what, what, would, what would your prayer be about if God gave you the answer? I know what I would be talking to God about. 
thank you for saving my life. Thank you for saving my life. Man, that was close. Thank you so much. But he's not really focused on himself here, is he? <clears throat> he's really focusing on God's power and God's might. And that God's in control and God's the one making these things happen. So he's really talking about what the, the dream means. And so he's, he's so impressed by Nebuchadnezzar's dream's meaning that he's been given the, the meaning to that that's what he focuses on in his prayer. So he's really praising God in this prayer. So his life is saved by God, but he uses that to praise God. But he talks about the fact that God's in control of what's happening in the nations. And that gives us some insight into the meaning of it that we'll be talking about on Sunday. But I just think that's impressive. And yet one more thing that we can think about to make application when we come to that section of our lessons is what he does when he's given this, this unbelievable answer to an unbelievable and impossible situation is he doesn't focus on himself. He focuses on God being in control and the, the might of God. So let's think a little bit about the explanation of the dream. We're, again, not going to get into the whole interpretation until Sunday. Um, how is Daniel's response brought before the king? In verses 24 and 25, how does the king find out Daniel has an answer? Yeah, so Ariok, who was supposed to kill all of them, is the one that takes the message back. What is, what, what's interesting to you about the wording of how Ariok went in to Nebuchadnezzar? There was, a, there was one word in there that really jumped out to me. Quickly, yeah. He didn't just go back, he went quickly. And that's, that's not Daniel going quickly, that's Ariok going quickly, right? So why do you think, I mean, did that stand out to you? Or does it now? Why? It wasn't Ariok's life on the line, was it? It was the wise men of Babylon, yeah. So maybe he's concerned about Babylon and its future and all the wise men. I think a little bit more he's maybe concerned about Daniel. Um, maybe he's concerned about the decision Nebuchadnezzar's making, and he wants to help you know, his king and his leader out. But it just shows that he's got some concern. He's got, there's something here that, that, that pulls at him. Personally, I think it's probably the same thing we saw back in chapter 1. Daniel's gained favor with him. So um, I, we don't know that. But that's, he's, he's rushing in for some reason to make sure this message gets to Nebuchadnezzar quickly. Um, so we'll come back and talk about the interpretation of the dream, like I said, on Sunday. Let's look at question six. What does Daniel 2.29 tell us about why Nebuchadnezzar had this dream from, from God? Why did he have this dream? To tell the future, yeah. So it says, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has revealed it to you. So Nebuchadnezzar was wondering what's going to happen, what's, what's the future hold for me, for my kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was wondering that. God gives him an answer, which I think is interesting. Um, what's really interesting to me is history tells us at this point in time, in this time frame around 602 B.C., they were in warfare with Syria. And Syria was still a powerful country, so it wasn't just the Babylon had taken over and they were the only power. They were, they were battling with Syria. And so it's interesting that that's going on and Nebuchadnezzar is wondering about what's going to happen in the future and then God gives him this answer. Um, and maybe that has some, and we'll, we'll talk more as we move forward, but maybe that comes into play in the big change we see in Nebuchadnezzar over the next couple chapters and what that, how that ends up impacting their whole nation and the statements he makes about God. But that would maybe explain his great anxiety about what this dream meant, right? He's wondering, what's going to happen to my nation? He's in this big battle with Syria, and he has this dream that's very different from any dream he's had. Now he's really anxious to know what it means because of what it was already on his mind. And it makes, and it makes a big difference. It's going to happen now. Right, right. Yeah, it's going to make a big difference. Okay, we'll pick up right there. Um, we're on question seven, so we'll pick up there, wrap this up, and then get it, go through the interpretation of the dream on Sunday. Thanks, everybody.